Hey, everybody. A great show today, you know, uh, for a change, because I have two friends of the podcast, Maria Teresa Kumar, founder and uh, president of Voto Latino, who did my very first podcast, and Mark Elias, a lead Democratic election lawyer, uh, who we check in with uh, from time to time, talk about the obstacles to voting that uh, Republicans put up to make it harder for certain people to vote. Uh, First, I want to talk about uh, this week's Supreme Court hearings uh, with Judge Amy Comey Barrett. I'm recording this before they start, but I got to just tell you, I am really pissed off about the hypocrisy of Republicans. You'll remember that uh, I was in the Senate when Justice Scalia died, and soon after, President Obama nominated Merrick Garland to the court. and. The Republicans would not take him up. They would not meet with him. They would not give him hearings. And uh, you remember why that was, was because it was uh, Justice Scalia died during an election year, an election year, died in February. You know, when I was in high school, I learned about the three-fifths compromise made at the Constitutional Convention for the purposes of representation in the United States House of Representatives, each slave in the slave states was to be counted as three-fifths of a person. Some of my classmates were outraged. How dare slaves be considered three-fifths of a human being? No, no, I I would argue they were not considered three-fifths human beings They really weren't considered human beings at all. They were slaves. They were enslaved people. They were considered chattel. They were bought and sold at slave markets. Children were separated from their parents or more likely just their mothers who had been routinely raped by their masters. They were bred and worked, and sometimes beaten and whipped to death. They weren't human beings, or considered human beings. They were just being counted to give their masters more political power in Washington, D.C. That's what the three-fifths thing was all about. I would argue that to my classmates. It was about political power, political power. We hold these truths to be self-evident, wrote Virginia slave holder Thomas Jefferson in his Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson, of course, did not mean that at all. As a widower... Jefferson took his slave, Sally Hemings, to Paris. When she was all of 14 years old, he fathered six children with her. He was, by all accounts and certainly by all standards of decency today, a monster. Sometimes I think our founding fathers are given just a little too much credit. Why exactly was the framework that they developed so doggone sacred, except when it isn't. When I was in the Senate, Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and every other Republican senator blocked the Supreme Court nomination of Merrick Garland by our first black president because it was 10 months before the next presidential election. It was, we were told, based on a hard and fast rule so-called Biden rule, that the Senate shall not take up a nomination of a Supreme Court nominee in a presidential election year. Of course, nothing of the sort was true. Justice Anthony Kennedy had been confirmed by a vote of 97 to 0 in February of 1988, which, if memory serves, was a presidential election year. So what was the Biden rule? Well, first of all, it wasn't a rule. After the Supreme Court 1991-92 term had ended in June of 92, uh, Senate Judiciary Chairman and Chairman Joe Biden made a speech 
Since the presidential election was just five months away, Biden said that if a conservative member of the court decided to announce his or her retirement between then and the election that created vacancy for a younger conservative, then President Bush should either consult with the committee on a nominee or nominate a moderate. If he did neither and nominated a committed arch-conservative, the Judiciary Committee, he said, would not take up the nomination. In contrast, Justice Antonin Scalia died in February of 2016, 10 months before the election. Dying was almost certainly not a calculated move on Scalia's part. Further, President Obama had consulted with Republican members of the Judiciary Committee. In fact, when Orrin Hatch had been its chairman, the Utah senator had discussed Merrick Garland with President Obama on many occasions calling Garland a consensus nominee who would no question be confirmed. And just a week before Obama nominated Garland Hatch, then the senior Republican on on judiciary, praised Garland several times, saying he'd be a qualified candidate. The, this is a quote from, from Hatch at that time. The president told me several times he's going to name a moderate to fill the court vacancy, but I don't believe him. Obama could easily name Merrick Garland, who is a fine man. He probably won't. Probably won't do that because this appointment is about the election. So I'm pretty sure he'll name someone the liberal Democratic base wants. Now, I brought all this up at the time during a business meeting of the Judiciary Committee, reading at length from the Biden speech that McConnell and every other Republican had deliberately and completely misrepresented. The Republicans on the committee had long before made their peace with tuning out unassailable refutations of their arguments made right to their faces. I I can see them now. Each had his own, you know, M.O. when you did that, uh, staring in the middle distance, uh, looking at his phone, smirking. That was That would be Cruz. It was during that business meeting that Lindsey Graham made one of his unequivocal assurances that were the shoe ever, ever on the other foot that he would call for waiting till after the next election to address any vacancy. And I'll quote him. I want you to use my words against me. If there's a Republican president In 2016, and a vacancy occurs in the last year of the first term, you can say Lindsey Graham said, let's let the next president, whoever it might be, make that nomination. And you could use my words against me, and you'd be absolutely right. I admit feeling a little funny using those words against him, even though he made such a big point at the time of saying that I would be absolutely right to do so. Still, I feel a little odd doing it because I guess it just makes him look like a a lying hypocrite. When he reversed himself recently, telling NBC that the rules have changed, he cited Harry Reid's 2013 rules change to allow a simple majority vote for circuit court nominees. Then again, you might note that by my calculation, 2013 was three years before 2016 when Graham said the words that he told us uh, we'd be absolutely right to throw back in his face. Still, in fairness, there was a newer second excuse. Chuck Schumer and his friends in the liberal media conspired to destroy the life of Brett Kavanaugh and hold that Supreme Court open. Of course, the Kavanaugh hearing had been in August 2018, a good two years out from the coming election, presumably giving Trump, uh, you know, (laughs) an opportunity to nominate someone who wasn't quite possibly a blackout drunk to a lifetime appointment in the Supreme Court. Also, could Graham explain then why months after 
Kavanaugh had been sworn in as associate justice, he told Jeffrey Goldberg of the Atlantic Monthly, if an opening comes in the last year of President Trump's term and the primary process has started, the primary process has started, (laughs) we'll wait till the next election. Hold the tape. Hold the tape. Meaning hold me to what I am saying. Oh, my God. What a lying hypocrite. Lindsay has become the poster child for shameless Republican hypocrisy. Okay, I'm sorry. One of the poster children. McConnell, Collins, Tillis, Ernst, McSally, Gardner, Danes, Hyde-Smith, Sullivan, Cornyn, and also McConnell come to mind. But still, Graham has really taken point, hasn't he? In a way that would be extraordinarily embarrassing to a person capable of embarrassment. The framework that the founders created has more or less worked for over two centuries. But that has required the observation of some norms. Norms that are not just being eroded, but which have been disappearing before our eyes over the past 11 years. It started with Mitch McConnell abusing the filibuster in a completely unprecedented way, all in the service of his unprecedented, explicitly stated goal. This is what he said, the single most important thing we want to achieve is for President Obama to be a one-term president. McConnell filibustered more Obama nominees for positions in his administration than had been filibustered in the entire previous history of the nation. He had been refusing to confirm Obama's nominees for federal judges, including three straight for vacancies in the D.C. Circuit, arguably the most important appeals court because it rules on cases involving the federal government. Before Harry Reid and our caucus went nuclear, the Senate met in a closed door off the record session in the old Senate chamber on the House side of of the Capitol. Soon after, a Republican senator from the South let us know that, and he said, there's a quote, the people in, in my state see Barack Obama as an alien. A number of us Democrats asked the Republicans to do a gang of 14. The Senate had uh, been in more or less the same situation in 2005, at least in the regard to judges, only in reverse. Minority Democrats had been filibustering Bush nominees to several circuit courts, and Republicans were threatening to go nuclear. 14 senators, seven Republicans and seven Democrats, hence gang of 14, made a deal. The Democrats agreed to pass through all but the most extreme Bush nominees, and the Republicans agreed not to go nuclear. It worked out then. How about just doing that? That's what we asked. No. No. Later that fall, the Republicans shut down the government for no good reason and continued to lie about what was and wasn't in the Affordable Care Act. Wyoming Senator John Barrasso, who is a medical doctor, would get up on the floor and deliver speeches titled A Second Opinion, which really should have been titled Another Lie. At the time, former Minnesota Senator David Durenberger, an old-school Republican and my friend, He was an honorable and reasonable guy. He was teaching, and is still, (laughs) was teaching a graduate school class in in healthcare at St. Thomas, a somewhat conservative Catholic university in in St. Paul, and had brought his students on their annual trip to D.C. He invited me and a few other of his former colleagues to talk to his class about the ACA. And when I arrived, I headed right into the conference room where Senator Brasso was having uh, his meeting with David's students. I hadn't gotten the memo that we were each supposed to meet separately and 
I'd come in at the tail end of Barrasso's time. Uh, he clearly didn't see me because he was, as usual, telling them just a bald-faced lie, is what he said. The Democrats say that it's supposed to cover millions of more Americans. But who's going to do that? Where are they going to get the doctors and nurses? There's not one word in this 2,000-page bill about workforce development. How not true is that? Wow. Wow. So not true. 253 pages not true. Because that is the length of Title V of the Affordable Care Act. The Health Care Workforce title. In the 2014 election, we lost the majority in the Senate and things really ground to a halt. And then came Merrick Garland. Now they are set to steal a second justice, giving them a 6-3 majority. Trump has already said, if I lose the election, that means it was rigged. When someone tells you that, what he's really saying is the only way I can win is to cheat. And he has done nothing but sow doubt about the legitimacy of the outcome, including spreading bullshit about vote-by-mail fraud, which is, for all intents and purposes, non-existent. In the midst of a pandemic, far more Democrats who understand the risks of voting in person than Republicans will vote by mail. And so in states which don't start counting mail-in ballots until Election Day, including Michigan and Pennsylvania, we know that Trump may very well be ahead on election night and declare victory. Given that 40% of Americans now buy into an alternative set of facts, it is not hard to see how Trump and Republicans drag out the bogus uncertainty past December 14th when the electors are scheduled to meet and declare the winner. And it's not hard, it's not impossible to see how this ends up in a 6-3 Supreme Court where the swing vote is not John Roberts, but Sam Alito or Neil Gorsuch. And that, that may very well be the end of democracy. Well, we got a great show uh, today. Maria Teresa Kumar and Mark Elias. Okay, I'll probably uh, record a, a, a different intro. But uh, with me uh, today, Maria Teresa Kumar... Uh, president and founder of Voto Latino. Maria Teresa, I'm a little confused on my terms because Latinx happened. When did that happen? A few years ago, right? So that we didn't. It's fairly new. Yes, it was fairly new. So Voto Latino, we are 16 years young. And about two years ago, I asked uh, a young intern from uh, Yale University if Voto Latino was still kosher with her. She's like, for right now, you guys are doing the right thing. So you're okay. <laughs> For now, for now, <laughs> for now. But I appreciated her, her bluntness, and thank goodness we were on the right side of her. So, <laughs> and it's Latinx. Yes, Latinx is a term that is very much around generational lines, but it is perhaps the most inclusive term that is in our lexicon to include folks that are not gender binary, and it's a total ex- inclusive of. Right, of you don't say Latina or Latino; you say Latinx. Correct. Mark, you're Jewish, right? I am. <laughs> I am too. I, I had no idea. Yeah. So, uh, and Mark is a, a lawyer, an election lawyer. That's a, a proper description of you, right? It is indeed. And you're with uh, Perkins Cooey. Yep. And are you sitting in the uh, Franken wing of uh, Perkins <laughs> Cooey, or at the? Are you in the Franken wing of the Elias household? The Elias household. But, okay. Uh, but either uh, way, it's comfortable. Maria Tracy, you may remember that uh, I had a long recount. 
from election yeah. day well, to oh, when I, I, I know I've, I've read the book. I've read your book. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I think full disclosure, Mark is also our attorney at Voto Latino. We decided if he's good enough for Al, he's good enough for us. <laughs> he's kind of everyone's attorney. Um, I know. And Mark, do you walk around with plexiglass? Because I sure as hell hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't go near the White House. That's all I can say. <laughs> man, oh, man. I was telling Mark earlier today, I talked to Mark earlier today, I'll, admit, I'll confess that, and I said that it seems like the White House is going for herd immunity. <laughs> no, no, it's just that uh, yep. it's it's an approach, herd immunity, and they're just experimenting with it by uh, not wearing masks and hugging <laughs> each other and uh and and uh, uh just talking very in very close to each other in a very lively friendly manner look all of us uh, maria Teresa, mark and i are praying for all of these people who have been infected uh that's what you you, you have to be that you have to do that and that's why we're doing it because you have to the reason I have you both on together is that we have an election coming up. And Mark, being an election lawyer, I think there's a lot of issues that we've all been hearing about. And I think, Mark, you're the guy. You're the, you're the lead Democratic election lawyer. And Maria Teresa is right there on the front lines uh, with Voto Latino, making sure that there isn't voter suppression for Latinx folks, right? Yes, indeed. I'm uh, committed to making sure that there is not voter suppression for anyone, including uh, the Latinx community. And Voto Latino has been a really great partner in, in all of that work. What's the work that you do for Voto Latino? Well, first and foremost, Voto Latino was a plaintiff in a very important voting rights case that we brought, uh, actually two cases that we brought um, to try to protect voting rights um, in uh, Arizona and in Texas. But I also have done, as Maria Trace has said, I've uh, worked with them on, uh, on other aspects of their program. And it's an organization that I, I can't say enough good things about. Yeah, I can't either. I mean, and, and Maria Teresa, thank you again for appearing. And, and you too, Mark. Um, so what were those two cases? And did you win them? <laughs> so, so the one in Arizona, we settled in an effort to try to get the maximum relief that we could get before election day. It uh, was aimed at the absentee balloting processes. So many of these also says was the Texas case, which uh, remains ongoing. The problem that voters face in general, but uh, which Latinx voters uh, face even in higher numbers than some other populations, are the problems of inaccessibility to make sure that their absentee ballots can be cast on time and counted. That has been the focal point. You know, you've read a lot in the newspaper recently about the problems of rejected absentee ballots. And a lot of those problems that exist in the general population hit uh, minority population, particularly Black and Latinx voters harder. And is that because of less services? It's by design, Al. I can share with you the gutting of the Voting Rights Act that happened under the Shelby County in back in 2013. Shelby County had experienced over a 60% increase in the Latinx population by 2010. And every single jurisdiction that followed, there were 22 jurisdictions that followed the gutting of judicial preclearance that is necessary in order to cast a ballot. Can, the, can I have Mark explain preclearance yes. only because he's a friggin' lawyer? I mean, I just want to use him, right? <laughs> might, yes, exactly. We're paying. No, we're not, actually. But still, go ahead. You, Al, you've paid enough over the years. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, the Voting Rights Act um, has several provisions to it. The most, the two most favor, most famous, rather, are Section 2. Uh, in Section 5, Section 5, what it did was it said that for certain jurisdictions in the United States, those with historic incidents of discrimination in voting, that before they could make a change in voting laws, they had to submit that change to the Department of Justice so that in advance it could be cleared, hence the term pre-clearance. Um, if they didn't want to go to the Department of Justice, they could go to a federal court in Washington, D.C., but it prevented jurisdictions with histories of racial discrimination in voting from making changes in voting without that pre-clearance. The assumption being that, you know, if the changes they were making were on the up and up, they'd get pre-cleared easily, but if they were having a negative impact, a 
what was referred in the law to as a retrogressive effect. In other words, they were setting voting rights back for the uh, minority voters in that area, then it could be blocked. And what Shelby County did is it struck down the formula by which- well, Before you say determined- that, before you say that, Mark, uh, it was working, right? Oh, it was great. It was working. It was working exceptionally well. In fact, um, it had been reauthorized under Republican presidents on a number of occasions and had been had enjoyed wide majorities, almost unanimity uh, in Congress among both Democratic and Republican. And, and, uh, and because it was working, you didn't need it anymore. Right. Isn't that what the chief justice said? Well, the chief justice seemed to say two things. One is that um, because it had worked, it was no longer necessary, uh, which, <laughs> right, which, right. I'm it's worse than <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep, keep going. I'll, I'll get off mic. <laughs> the, the, the second thing, he, the second thing they, that, that they said, which honestly never made much sense to me, was that um, because it only covered certain states and certain counties within states, it denied states the, quote, equal dignity of each other because certain states were essentially stigmatized. I always found this argument odd. We have been stigmatized. I found it an odd odd argument because the power Congress was using in passing this provision of the Voting Rights Act was power given to it under the post-Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And it always struck me that for a bunch of originalists, which is what the Chief Justice and the conservatives on the court claim they are, it always struck me as unlikely that having just come out of a civil war, that the folks in Congress who passed these amendments really much cared about the equal dignity of, of Southern states not being stigmatized. I think, in fact, you know, they were the, the the idea that that states with a history of of race discrimination being subject to additional scrutiny was, frankly, entirely what Congress probably had in mind at the time it passed the amendments. So those were the two grounds that Chief Justice and the court ruled to strike down the coverage formula of Section Five. So in theory, they didn't say you couldn't have a Section Five. They just said that the formula by which it derived which states and counties were covered was problematic. Now. The Democrats since then have come forward with a new version that says, fine, we'll fix the formula. We'll make the formula, you know, address the concerns that the Supreme Court said. And the House has passed that. And um, the Senate Democrats obviously stand ready to vote for it. But Senator McConnell has refused to uh, to bring it to a floor vote. Okay. So in the meantime, Maria Teresa, they seem to be targeting the Latinx community. Well, that's the thing is that the gutting of Shelby County, basically, the the Republicans did their homework. They actually crunched data. And what the 2010 census basically said that we had 51% of the growth in this country between 2000 and 2010 was due to Latino births. And 51% of American uh, Latinos who happened to be Latinx. And so when they saw this, they basically said, well, we have to get the Voting Rights Act because we can't ever allow these individuals to actually participate and vote. Because if they did, they may not vote for us. Instead of modernizing their own platforms, they got to work and gutted the Voting Rights Act, preparing for this election. And what I mean by that is that they read the tea leaves. I wish the Democrats had read them too, uh, and saw that you were going to have millions of of Latinx kids turning 18 for the very first time by 2020. So for the first time this election, Al and Mark knows this, we're going to be the technically the Latinx community is going to be the second largest voting bloc in American history for us as a community. And that is because 40% of all eligible voters are under the age of 33. Just since 2016, when the president went down that escalator and called their, you know, called our loved ones rapists and criminals. Since that day, we've had over 4 million young Latinos come of age who will be able to cast a ballot for the very first time. The folks that went to the preclearance was was vacated. The 22 jurisdictions that followed Shelby County had experienced at least a 40% increase in their schools of young Latinos participating. So this was this was context because they saw today. They took the, the data seriously. They saw there was going to be an aging in population of eligible voters. And instead of doing what 
should happen, where people are competing on the basis of ideas, they decided that the most efficient way was just to shut down the the access to the voting booth for the Latino community. You know, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We, we have an election coming up very, very soon. But um, if they lose, do you think there's a chance that the Republican Party will, will ever change? So I, I'll take a shot at that because I, I think one of the when historians look back on this era, I think they will spend more time than we have in contemporary you know, times focused on the pivot between George Bush, who you know I carried no candle for. I represented uh, John Kerry in, in 2004. But his efforts to reach out to the Latinx community and then the autopsy report that the RNC put together after 2012, that when you took those two together, what you saw was there was a moment in time where the RNC and the Republican Party was internally debating whether or not it would try to join the coming demographic changes of the country or whether it would simply try to resist them. And I think that 2016 will be remembered as much as anything else in the history books as the moment that the RNC ended that debate and made a decision that it was going to just try to suppress the vote of Black and brown voters in particular, but but anyone other than their base coalition. I, I'm actually of the mind that the Republican Party ha- may have basically lost its course. It didn't pay attention to its autopsy that it did back in 2012, where it had to reinvigorate itself, reimagine itself. And I think that they are going to be a lost party. Um, I think that Donald Trump won't be their last gasp. I think they'll try it again. But I think that the realignments that we're going to see will actually come out of the Democratic Party, because it is such a big tent party where people are going to start wondering where, you know, where are the are there going to be splinters within the Democratic Party where one is still very moderate and one is saying we have to think audaciously for where we are today. That, that's where I see the future, very similar to what we saw at the last turn of the century. There's so many parallels uh, from the last the, the last turn of the century, right? So you could actually say that the twenty the twentieth century really started in, right around World War One in. 1914, and one can claim that the 21st century is going to start for our country, February 2020. And what is it that, how, how are we going to think as audaciously as our Amer- fellow Americans did 100 years ago? And are we willing to roll up our sleeves and, and take the charge of nation build uh, for a country that looks vastly more diverse and more different than 100 years ago? Yeah. Now, this is not assuming a victory in a few weeks. This is not assuming that at all. And we have to do every damn thing we can to make to make sure we defeat this guy. Absolutely. And I, I hate being partisan on on this podcast because we're uh, strictly. <laughs> <laughs> what will people think? <laughs> so, what does this work look like for the two of you? It's a very overlapping thing, right? It is. I think that it's nuts and bolts, right? So it's the beginning of making sure that we are enfranchising the most disenfranchised for the very first time this election. You're going to have. 12 million more young voters than older voters. Two thirds of them are young kids of color and they're angry, rightfully so, because the promise that was guaranteed just a generation before is almost absent, right? When we talk, for example, of gig workers, we're talking about 60 million Americans who thought the side gig was a side gig and now is a permanent gig and no one's talking to them. So the work that Mark does is that he helps us, you know, counsel as we try to make sure that we're setting up the best systems of the work today. But then when we see real disenfranchisement and discouragement, sometimes even uh, rightfully so by the American people, because you have a government that touts democracy, but does not breathe democracy and doesn't implement democracy, he's there to fight it, to make sure that we do live up to the standard of what the Constitution laid out for us. Now, Mark, I know you're, you're juggling a lot of balls, and one of them's in Texas, right? Uh, Several of which are in Texas, yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Texas has a large Latinx population, and you have a Republican governor there who would like to continue the work of the Republican Party and uh, prevent as many people (laughs) from voting as possible, particularly Latinx. If you think about how different that is from where the Republican Party of Texas used to be, it's really shameful. Not that they were ever great, but they were not as uniformly 
Trump-like. Ray Tracy, tell me if I'm wrong in this. Texas was part of Mexico. It was Mexico. So there are a lot of Texans who are both Texans and Mexicans. They're Tejanos, right? Like, that's what they feel. And I think this is where the Democratic Party really gets it wrong. And that's why I'm so grateful that Mark is in the fight in Texas, is that out of all the states, the biggest pool of eligible voters that are Latinx are in Texas. You have over 5 million eligible voters in Texas. You have 2.5 million of them who are under the age of 33. And Texas, for all intents and purposes, is what California was when I was growing up under Pete Wilson, where you had this aspirational generation of young people who were being told they weren't American. And then they saw their families really being separated and crushed by this man who was a bigot. Pete Wilson. Pete Wilson. He lost in a big way. And California went from a swing state to permanently blue as a result. That's where Texas is. It's not just that Trump is a bad guy. And it's not just that he's separating families and have babies in cages. I mean, that alone should be enough to mobilize someone. But in Abbott, you have someone that is so perverse that he signed SB4. SB4 is the worst immigration law right now on our books, where a public official or a teacher could pull a child aside who's a minor and ask them if they're American. Imagine if that was your kid who was seven years old and someone has the audacity of asking that child, are you American? That's obscene. And it is that type of legislation and that racial profiling that is really hitting the Latino community hard. Let's not even start with the pandemic that is COVID that is disproportionately impacting Latino Texans right now, because you have a guy who who stigmatized the best defense that any parent could have, and that was whether or not to wear a mask. And it just it's, it just slides from there, right? So how's that working out for him? His callousness. He's not, he, the fa- I, I talked to my mother today, and she was so upset because sadly we lost someone in our family. She runs an elder care facility, and she's like, the fact that this man doesn't even protect the Secret Service to protect him. If he doesn't care about the people who he interacts with every day. What are the chances that he's going to care about any of us? And that's true. Yeah. And and Latinx people are bearing the burden more than anybody else. And I think second most are. We're 34 percent of sadly of the deaths and the and the tracing. I'll give you just an example. In California, in the General Hospital of San Francisco, Latinx population is 30 percent of the population. We were we have been over 80 percent of the cases of COVID cases. And that has, that has a lot to do with jobs. That's all stuff we're going to have to address if we are successful in this election. What's the case in Texas, Mark? The one that is the most right now top of mind is challenging the actions of Governor Abbott. So this really, to me, shows the callousness of the Republican Party right now on voting. So we are in the middle of a pandemic, and the Republicans throughout the country have fought tooth and nail against um, expanding absentee balloting rights, including in Texas, where they fought to prevent the ability for everyone to be able to vote absentee. So by definition right now in Texas, the people who are voting absentee are either elderly or are suffering some type of illness that prevents them from voting in person. So we already know that Texas has restricted that. And we know that in state after state, Republicans are fighting drop boxes, which are sensible ways. If you had asked me what was on my voter suppression card for 2020, I would not have had a war on drop boxes, but we've seen from states as diverse as Iowa, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, we've seen Republicans take steps to limit drop boxes. Fine. So they don't want drop boxes. So what was the solution in Texas? The solution in Texas was allow county offices, a county election offices to receive in person uh, ballot delivery, not third party ballot delivery, which, you know, they, they excoriate third party ballot delivery saying that that's ballot harvesting. It's not even drop boxes. It's people going to county election offices and physically handing in ballots. And the governor issued an executive order that said that counties can only have one such location that will accept hand delivered ballots per county. Well, that's preposterous. I mean, Harris County is the size of several states in this country. Uh, It's got a very large and diverse population. 
and it had 12 offices. And now under this executive order, it would have one. Um, it's not only Harris County that's affected, but it's an example. And there simply isn't any reason to do this other than to make voting harder and to endanger people's lives who are already the most vulnerable because Texas is only letting the most vulnerable vote by mail to begin with. So we filed a lawsuit uh, late on Friday. Uh, after this order came out on Thursday, we moved for preliminary relief uh, today, and I expect a hearing uh, in the coming days. And wh where is that case? Is it what court? We filed it in federal court in Texas, and uh, you know we're hopeful that uh, that the court will will take into account the difficulties faced by voters. And is that a district court or a circuit court? Yeah. No, it's district court. District court. court. Yeah, one judge. One judge. Okay, so th this brings up something we were discussing today, which is what the Republicans have done on judges. Yeah. Don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the federal bench has, has changed more in the last three and a half years than in the rest of my legal career. You look at some of the courts of appeals, you know, you have enormous skew in terms of who's been appointed. You know, someone said to me, you know, what the Democrats need to do is they need to shut down the Senate and not let legislation pass. And I said to them, well, I've got good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is there is no legislation pass being passed. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing to shut down. Uh, the only thing McConnell does is judges. Um, and as you know, Al, the judges calendar is different than the legislative calendar. You know, McConnell has really made that his top priority and he has changed Senate rules to make this happen, um, both the blue slip and also the filibuster rule. Like he's done a lot of things to try to to try to um, reshape the judiciary. It came up in the debate, and in the debate, Trump said, "Shame on Obama for leaving all these openings," and that was because we had the blue slip. And I think my audience, we we've talked about this before, but it was a mechanism by which uh, senators could block a judge. Uh, being nominated to, to your state's spot on a, a federal court, a district or, or circuit, uh, by uh, the president of another party. And you had the blue slip. And the way most Democrats at least used it was, look, if you're a Republican, you nominate a real right-wing Republican uh, judge, I'm not going to say yes. So I won't turn in my blue slip. I mean, I won't approve that. But I'll, I'll appoint a committee in my state of well-respected lawyers, and they'll will pick someone who is a Republican, but who is reasonable, and that's how it would work. But during Obama, senators like Ted Cruz and Cornyn and uh, Rand Paul and uh, McConnell just would not let that happen. That's an accurate portrayal, right? Absolutely. And as a result, there are all these judges, and they got rid of the blue slip. And, and that's going to ruin the federal court forever, I think. Well, I think because they're so young, and they're, they're fundamentalists, right? So they stack the bench in a way that is going to be incredibly harmful, because the people that they've stacked with, it's disproportionately all white men. No offense, Alan Mark, uh, but all white men. And we're, we're Jewish. We're not white. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Al, I can always count on you for a ray of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the ruling it is that we're not going to, if, if, if Biden wins and the Senate becomes Democratic, you can bet the blue slip ain't coming back. So that, that it's destroyed the federal judiciary more than just because they have all these young right-wing people that are going to be there forever, these judges that are going to be there forever. They've ruined it for all time because tit for tat, right? We should all be angry about it because the, these judges actually don't reflect the, the making of, of America. That's the danger, is that you have a whole bunch of folks that are stuck somewhere in the 1800s. Trying How to many make... cases, Mark, are you doing on behalf of Voto Latino? Two. And what are those? Arizona and, and Texas. Is, is the Texas one we were talking about that? No, no. The Texas case involves a much broader challenge to the rules about how absentee ballots are counted and processed. What you find in our country, and I think it goes to what Maria Teresa said when you asked her, why are things different? Uh, and I think she said, it's on, essentially, it's on purpose. Um, so here's some data behind that. When you look at 
rejected mail-in ballots. And in every election, there are some number of mail-in ballots that are rejected, usually about 1%. When you look within that 1%, what you find is that young voters have their ballots rejected at much higher rates than older voters. You find that Black and Latinx voters have their ballots rejected at much higher rates than white voters. And in fact, in one study in Georgia, it showed that women actually had a higher rejection rate than men. So you could literally say that if you were to design a system to benefit old white men, this would be the system. Whether it was done that way intentionally or it just happened to work out that way, I think people can take different approaches. But the truth is, there's no question that that is the system we have and that as a society, we need to do better. We need to strive to have a system where the rules of the game don't leave uh, certain groups out or advantage some groups over others. Why, why uh, does it end up that way? Why, why, what about these laws make it end up that way, that it is disenfranchising more minority and women than poor? Look at the 2018 Florida. Um, this was the race that Bill Nelson lost the Senate race by one-tenth of a percent. Andrew Gillum lost by four-tenths of a percent. What you find is that ballots cast by those 18 to 21 were rejected at a a rate of 5.4%. Those cast by those over the age of 65 were rejected at a 0.6%. So literally the difference between one out of 20 versus one out of 200. When you look at race uh, and ethnicity, you see that whites had a rejection rate less than 1%. Black and Latinx voters had a rejection rate closer to 2.5%. That's the reality. Now, why is that? It has something to do with the rules about what the cutoff deadline is for ballots, whether it has to be postmarked by or received by election day. We know that many areas that are predominantly Latinx and predominantly Black suffer from less reliable mail service or mail service that takes longer. And that will have a profound impact on ballots arriving too late, which is one of the main reasons ballots are rejected. Another is signature matching. You know, states oftentimes verify ballots by comparing signatures. Uh, Al, you'll remember this from, from the 2008-2009 timeframe, when election officials look at one signature on file and compare it with a signature on a return envelope, errors get made in that process. Well, what, what we know is that those errors don't get evenly distributed. They tend to be more focused on non-anglicized names, particularly non-anglicized surnames, and also younger voters who tend to have a less consistent signature than older voters do. Hmm. I remember one case in Minnesota where there was a young man who, in front of his mom, I think did we, in Minnesota we had witnesses, you know, have yeah. a witness. So his mom was a witness and he signed it and she went, what's that? He goes, oh, that's my signature. She goes, no, 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 you have a much neater signature. <laughs> so he had to get another ballot and do it. And his very neat signature that his mother approved of didn't match the one he had registered with, right? So his vote was kicked out, but we got it. We got it back because you're, you're a genius. <laughs> Interesting because Minnesota, after that election, reformed its system so that now they only match signatures if the voter doesn't include the last four digits of their driver's license number. Now, there are problems with doing the last four digits of driver's license as well, because not everyone has a driver's license and people don't always know that number. But it's a way that Minnesota has dramatically decreased the number of signature rejections because all of those ballots where people fill that in get automatically cleared. And so the officials can spend their time ensuring that they're looking at the signature comparisons more carefully and making sure that voters have an opportunity to be notified if there's a rejection and cure it. You'll remember, Al, one of the things out of 2008 in Minnesota was that voters weren't told that their ballots didn't count until we got the lists and told them. And there are still states in this country that don't tell voters when their ballots are being rejected. And that's wrong. And that needs to be changed in the states that it's not. And that's some of the litigation we've brought. At what point are you told in, in the states where they tell you that your ballot's being rejected? The way that this typically works is that as the ballot is processed, which means the outer envelope is compared to make sure that it's filled out properly. If it needs to be witnessed, it's witnessed. If, you know, signature match, signature match is done. If there is a problem at that stage that the ballot, that, it's, that it doesn't meet those requirements, the voter receives a call, an email, a text, a letter, whatever it is, and is told there's a problem with your ballot that it doesn't meet these requirements. 
either fill out this form and tell us this was in fact your ballot or call us or text us. It depends. Different states have different, allow different methods. And then they cure it. And that's really important because you find big, big cure rates. And you'll remember in the recount in 2008, we brought in voters after voters after voters and cured ballots by just having the voters say, yeah, that's my signature. You know, yeah, I did vote that ballot. And so uh, making sure that, that that happens is really, really important. And that was after the fact, but because mail-in votes can be early, do those get kicked out early and get resolved before Election Day? So in states that process them before Election Day, which is the best practice, which is the practice that every state should have and which nonpartisan groups and really every election official of any of either party wants, that's the case. There are some states like Pennsylvania, where the Republican legislature refuses, at least so far, to pass a law that allows the processing of absentee ballots before Election Day. And there, uh, in those states, it doesn't happen until the ballots are processed after Election Day. Which and I think on Election Day, you have states that just don't start start counting mail-in votes until election day. And Pennsylvania and Michigan are two of those? Yeah. So it's one thing to not start counting it at the beginning of the election day, which is bad. Pennsylvania doesn't even let you start counting until the polls are closed. So we're worried about mischief from the Republican legislature, et cetera, in Pennsylvania, are we? I'm worried about mischief from the Republicans everywhere, because not only don't we have preclearance, not only Do we have a pandemic? Not only do we have Donald Trump who will do and say anything in the White House, but remember the Republican National Committee had been under a consent decree, which is basically another way of saying a court order to not engage in poll monitoring or voter suppression efforts. And that consent decree expired in December of 2017. So they've already announced they're going to spend $20 million in court and they're going to recruit 50,000 poll watchers. So I'm worried about it anywhere, but I I am worried about it in Pennsylvania for sure. And in Pennsylvania, he brought that up during the uh, the debate, and he said that uh, there were poll watchers, Republican poll watchers, who showed up and they're kicked out. First of all, they were not in a location that uh, required the allowance of poll watchers. They were not at a polling place, <laughs> so so he was wrong on that score. But it is interesting that the RNC and the Trump campaign are currently suing the state of Pennsylvania to require them to allow people from other counties to act as poll watchers. So right now, Pennsylvania law says if you want to be a poll watcher in Philadelphia, you have to live in Philadelphia. They want to do away with that requirement. I wonder why that would be. Yeah. Right. That would be. So Maria Teresa, let's, let's get back to how many uh, Latinx people have you, voted Latino, registered? We have registered over 455,000. And we have concentrated that voter registration number, 455,403, because every vote counts, as Mark knows. Uh, and that was as of this morning. Today, we had three major deadlines for us, which was Arizona, Florida, and Texas. So we expected to register another twenty to 30,000 today. So uh, hopefully we will be close to that 500,000 mark. That was half a million. That was our goal, uh, but we're not stopping there. And we deeply believe that not only is it important to register, but we have started now talking to the low propensity voters that Mark mentioned earlier in the conversation. Where we've identified 3.7 million low propensity Latinx voters uh, that historically don't get a call from a campaign or a candidate. Our job right now is to mobilize the heck out of them. And we're disproportionately, those are concentrated just in five states. We're going to be mobilizing uh, voters in Arizona, in Florida, North Carolina, Nevada, you mentioned Pennsylvania, and then of course, Texas. Uh, and we think that uh, just as Florida is in play, Texas is also in play. And we hope that we not only mobilize, but that we also change the pathway of the country. And Mark is ensuring that we have the laws and access to the voting booth to ensure that that every single person's vote does get counted and that we are enfranchised. This has been such trying times for everyone. And I think that for us at Voto Latino, that despite the trying times, we entered the pandemic having registered 88,000 folks. And when we told people that we were gonna stick by our goal of half a million, Many organizations had to pivot. We didn't. We basically just kept going because we knew that people are hungry for participation because they are in such distress. And we've been fortunate enough that, uh, you know, Al, you've helped us, that we've been able to find the resources to do the work. But what we did change and what we did pivot was that we were originally only going to mobilize 1.5 million low propensity voters. Uh, Latino Decisions came out with a poll and found that 50% of registered Latinos had not received a contact from the campaign or the party. 
that's when we can step in. Uh, we have a really good a good apparatus where we reach roughly 15 million Latinx folks a month across our social channels, and we will be talking to them and you know by sending them text messages, by sending them mail, by going from the cool older sister to the sweet nagging aunt that you love to make sure that you go out and vote. And that does take resources. So just for our listeners, how might people give money to Perkins Cooey? <laughs> 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 like, you're that, already uh, Latino. How's that? <laughs> yeah, okay, or that, or or Voto Latino. Better, better idea. <laughs> uh, no, but if folks are interested, you know, if they if they go to votolatino.org, not only can they donate, but if they're interested in volunteering, we are we are COVID safe volunteering apparatus where we will provide you with all the information you need to help us mobilize and contact those voters uh, that we need to show up. How about poll workers? Yes. So we partnered with a great organization. It's Power to the Polls. If folks go to powertothepolls.org, they can sign up to become poll workers and we need poll workers. One of the challenges in Georgia was that poll workers were so afraid to show up that that's uh, what caused so much of the chaos and confusion. So we need a new generation of folks that are hungering to be part of our democracy. And I encourage people to start voting if they can't already in their states. Uh, please just vote once. Uh, do, do not follow the directions of the president. Vote fast and vote once and make a plan to vote. Just like, you know, Mark and Al, we had a date for tonight and we put in our calendars and we showed up to make this great podcast. I encourage your listeners to make a plan to vote and uh, make a date with democracy. Plan to vote, but, but Mark, you told me early in the cycle that maybe the most important thing people can do is become poll watchers. I'm not poll yes. watchers, poll workers, poll workers. Yeah, no, no, don't be poll watchers, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One of the problems that our democracy has is that we rely on typically very elderly people to work polls um, on election day. And, you know, you can only open as many polling locations as you have enough poll workers. So there are a number of organizations that are doing really, really good work in recruiting and training uh, poll workers. One of them is Power the Polls, uh, which I recommend. Uh, but uh, otherwise, people can just call their local county election officials and learn how to get trained if you're young and healthy and willing to work on election day. So if you're young, it'd be really... And, and uh, how long does it take to get trained up as a poll worker? It depends on the place, but it's usually a one-day training class. Um, and then you can do your part to help democracy. The more poll workers we have, the more voting places we have right yes correct you told me something about like during the wisconsin primary there were only what five places to vote in the city of milwaukee right in the primary there are normally 180 polling locations open in the city of milwaukee okay in the primary they had five and that was because of the scarcity of of poll poll workers. Workers. Yeah. Yeah. So just to go back in time, remember that the April primary that was when Wisconsin was held was the same day that every other state, I think it was six other states, were supposed to have their primaries and canceled them due to COVID. COVID was at that point really starting to surge. I mean, now it's like pervasively everywhere. The Republican legislature refused to move the day, whereas all the other states did. But the result was that they had a real shortage of poll workers. And the net result was only five polling places open in the city of Milwaukee. So the best thing we can do to encourage turnout is to have enough poll workers, to have enough polling places to make it easier for people to vote. Correct. Okay. I can't, I don't think we can emphasize that enough. So it only takes a day. If you're young, you can replace someone who's 70 some years old, who may not want to go out and someone who's like Donald Trump's age and doesn't want to <laughs> expose themselves or the people around them who work for them. <clears throat> like he does. Let's segue back into uh, the 2020 election. And let me tell you why. It's it's coming up very soon. Maria Teresa, the states you were talking about, North Carolina is another one of the states you were talking about, which is very much uh, in play here, right? Absolutely. No, I think that, I mean, and this is the, the fun part, right? We have Arizona, North Carolina, and Texas, three states for Voto Latino that are particularly important because we also have Senate seats up for grabs. In Texas, we're interested because not only do we have a chance at flipping it, but we also have a chance of flipping the state house, which would be huge for redistricting uh, that will help determine 
I think not just where this Texas lies, but where the rest of the country will. The state house, you mean the governor or the House of Representatives? The state house of representatives. They do not have uh, Medicaid expansion in Texas, which is crazy and cruel, especially around the COVID epidemic that we're that we're right now pandemic that we're that we're facing. And flipping that house that would mean because almost every state, the last states, I've said this a number of times on on this podcast. The last states by referendum to approve Medicaid expansion are Idaho, Nebraska, Utah, Oklahoma, and Missouri. And that's because Medicaid expansion is unbelievably beneficial to uh, people in rural and red areas. So I hope hope Texas does that. Okay, you guys. Um, anything else you want to cover? I, I'm supposed to be the guy guiding this, so that sounds <laughs> pathetic. I think we just want people to vote and vote early, right, Mark? Yep, that's exactly right. All I want is for people to make sure they're registered, vote. If you want to vote by mail, get your ballot early, vote it early. If you want to vote in person and your state has in-person early voting, vote early. Absolutely. Vote early. Then uh, you got that out of the way. Then the volunteer to be a poll worker, not a poll watcher. Yeah, and they can go to powertothepolls.org and they can go ahead and fill that out. And if they want to volunteer at Voto Latino, they can text volunteer to 73179. And you don't need to speak Spanish in order to volunteer. Uh, don't let that be a precursor to anything. And if you want to donate, you can go to votolatino.org. Um, I do have a website, Democracy Docket, that if people want to track the litigation that we've talked about or want to see other information about voting, they can go there and they can learn that information. So that's uh, democracydocket.com, and it'll inform you a lot about what are, what these issues are, right? Absolutely. Well, uh, Maria, Teresa, great talking to you again. Uh, hope that uh, when this is all over, we get to uh, see each other, maybe have lunch or something. I would love that. Thanks so much, Al. And thanks for the work that you're doing and for highlighting these issues and for making it fun while you do it. See, it's fun. You see? everybody and uh <laughs> and mark thank you for uh help me uh get to the senate and uh for all the work you're doing to make it possible for people to vote when these jerks are doing everything they can to prevent that i am always happy to talk to you al you're an inspiration to us on all of these issues and you know i'll be fighting till the end and i know maria choice will be right there with me well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. <laughs>